Hello everyone, this is What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. Today I'm on with Dr. Paul Evans. We're talking about the historicity of First and Second Samuel, King David, King Saul. Are these historical texts? What are they saying? Uh, Dr. Paul Evans has written a lot on this topic, so he's going to be able to give us a great insight into the discussion. How are you doing today, Dr. Evans? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right. So for those unaware of your work so far, could you give us just a, a brief little intro into what you've written on? Sure. Yeah. So uh, most of my academic work has been on the historical books of the Old Testament. So I have a, a couple of books on the um, on a historical event in the book of Kings where Assyrian King Sennacherib invades Judah when Hezekiah is king. So a couple of books on that. I have a commentary on first and second Samuel, and I'm right now writing a, a two volume commentary on the books of Chronicles. So I'm actually just finishing up, uh, the second Chronicles right now, which I've written first, and then I'm going to go back and write, <laughs> write first Chronicles actually. Okay. And, uh, so I've written a bunch of articles on Kings and Chronicles and, uh, Samuel, uh, that that's really my forte is, uh, mm. historical books. Very cool. All right. So uh, this is going to be a very important question to this discussion because you have a lot of people that I guess see the, the, the Old Testament and, you know, the entire Bible as like, if, it, if it's historical, then, you know, maybe that could be issues for, you know, the truth of Christianity. So this is a really important question I wanted to ask you. How much impact do you think the historicity of First and Second Samuel have on the truth of Christianity? It, like, hypothetically saying if if the entire thing is made up what does that do to the, the truth of christianity yeah i i think that um the, it depends on the truth claims of the text mm. so some and so in some ways you get into issues of genre if um like in the psalms you have uh, the psalmist say god you're my rock we don't assume that means he's He's actually a sedimentary object. It has, you know, a metaphorical, symbolic meaning. True. And that's how we take it, because that's part of the genre of poetry. And so similarly, the genre of Samuel, mm -hmm. if it was uh, ancient historiography, then the, the truth claims it's making go along with the lines of that genre. And I think that if it is ancient historiography, which does is concerned with historical events and giving a, a true presentation of things that happened mm -hmm. and people who existed, if it turned out that none of that was true, then yeah, it would be a problem for that text and, mm -hmm. and the Bible and the, the truth claims of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But if uh, the genre that's written in is uh, uh, some, some of the aspects of Samuel that some people point to that don't seem to line up with how we would write history today, mm -hmm. um, well, it's not writing history like we would today. So in some respects, it doesn't have to line up with kind of a modern history genre. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think it would be problematic because I believe it is ancient historiography that if, that if it was just fictional or made up, that would be problematic for its truth claims and the truth claims of scripture. And uh, uh, by uh, extension, the claims of Christianity. Interesting. Okay. All right. So yeah, you talked about the word historiography. Most people aren't going to be familiar with that. Uh, before we get into that, um, most, the, at least people that I grew up around, at least, um, saw the, the, the book of Samuel, first and second Samuel as, as a historical book. Now, can you talk about I, what, what that kind of means in, in the eyes of most people and, and, and maybe a little bit of where that idea came from? Yeah, so uh, I think that I still refer to them as historical books as well. Yeah. And so it's the idea that the book is depicting historical events and persons who existed in history. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I still think that that's the case, that the author Samuel is concerned with real events, real people. Uh, and in that, in that case, it, it's historical books is appropriate. The term historiography is sometimes used to refer to the writing of history, whereas maybe we could say history is the event. So uh, history can become a bit ambiguous as whether we're talking about the, the written account, the events themselves. So I often like to distinguish by saying historiography, plus um, to distinguish it a bit from modern history writing. So I do think that um, the historical books is still uh, an appropriate title, but what we mean by that exactly um, 
may come down to more specifics of, of the, the genre, because I, I really think it's important to recognize that it's written in an ancient genre. So as I said, with the Psalms, we understand it's poetry, we understand its claims are within that genre. And, you know, like the book of Hebrews says, God spoke in so many different ways through the years um, uh, in the old King James, diverse ways, it said. Um, and uh, it, all those different ways uh, should be interpreted according to the genre of the type of literature we're looking at. And so I think it is important to distinguish uh, ancient historiography from modern historiography, not to argue against the, uh, the truth claims that they make, but so that we could have the right kind of expectations for what we're going to draw out of, out of the written um, source we're looking at. Mm, sure. Okay. All right. So, yeah, well, when you, since we're going to go ahead and talk about that, what, what is historiography? Um, and maybe you talked about, you know, nowadays compared to back then, what, what are the differences there? Help people understand that. Well, like in, in ancient history writing, um, you could say maybe it's a little more artistic, could be one way of looking at it. Um, Phil Long has a great book, if you're interested in this subject, called The Art of Biblical History. V. Phillips Long writes it. I would recommend that to your viewers to read. But he, he for example, uses the example of art. So history is representational art. So if you look at a painting and... Uh, uh, maybe even a very realistic painting. I remember back in the 90s, uh, at least up here in Canada, Robert Bateman was very popular. He had all these pictures of animals and landscapes. And they, they almost looked like a photograph when you looked at them. But the closer you get to that picture, uh, the more you start to realize it's not a photograph. You, you see brush strokes. You see that it's artistically framed. But when you look back from a distance, it looks very representational. It looks very realistic. And similarly, biblical historiography, I think, is representationally accurate. That The picture we get of David, that's what David was like. But the closer you get to um, the image, the more you start to see the artistic brush strokes that are part of it. So if you think of history as representational art it gives a fair representation but it's art it's artistic so in, in the ancient world when they wrote history um, more so than today where we try and be objective just just the facts <laughs> kind of thing um, back in the day uh, chronology was not as important uh, but maybe themes were more important so you could you could put events together thematically and not always on a strict chronological mm -hmm. basis um, they would use uh, speeches or narrative formulas to structure uh, the events and instead of strictly following a chronological order, perhaps. And the speeches we see in ancient historian Thucydides, a Greek historian, um, he talks about the speeches that he has in his work. And he, he says that they're kind of his own creative compositions for what he thought must have been said at the time. So the speeches he has are not based on transcripts of the speeches, mm -hmm. but based on all the evidence he could gather as to what happened and, and, and who said what, uh, he writes the speech to what he think was probably said. And probably that's, and, and he explicitly says that's part of his process, that's part of the genre, you could say. And so similarly, the speeches you might find in Samuel and King's, are likely the composition of the author rather than based on a transcript. And uh, a lot of critical scholarship has borne this out by looking at the use of vocabulary in all these speeches told by disparate people. So you might have Samuel speaking, you might have Solomon speaking, Moses or, or, or you know, Moses Joshua or something like this. And you find uh, repeated vocabulary and style through the out, which seems to indicate huh. that the same author wrote those speeches probably summarizing or, or putting into the mouth of those characters what they thought was said, what was a good representation of the speech. But the closer you get, you start to see that it's, oh, we got the actual words, the, the typical vocabulary of that author that actually come into the speech. So in that case, they're not a verbatim transcript of what was said, but they're a fair representation of what was said at the time. So those are the types of things that might be different. We're in modern history. And modern history writing, they might have a transcript of a speech, or they might say they're summarizing it, but they wouldn't say this is exactly what is said, because uh, it's just a different, the genre has changed, right? Modern history writing is a little different. So, uh, and uh, ancient Greek historians are often thought to be the father of history, like Herodotus, and then you got a lot of other Greek historians. 
many which are, are, are lost to us, but we have a lot, of, a lot of examples of them. And the biblical author in Samuel uses a lot of the same kind of, um, you could say, speech forms, the same kind of style as is found in Greek historiography. So the Bible in Samuel seems to show the same kind of historical method of the maybe ancient Greek historiography in many ways. Um, and this means that it actually is good history writing for the time, um, but it's not necessarily the same as we would do today. And it's not. And one of the reasons they recorded history in the ancient world was, of course, to so we could learn a lesson. We could uh, learn what the moral of the story is. Whereas in modern history writing, this is not something they want to do. Um, they Some even think there is no point to history at all, right? But we're recording the facts and we're trying to record causation of, of why something happened. But to draw a moral out of it, that, that's that's kind of beyond the pale of a modern history. But in the ancient world, that's the whole point, right? And so the Bible is concerned with, with uh, that its audience would know God, would know how God acted in the past and with his people. And an example could be seen in, in like sometimes there'll be a reference like in Kings where it'll say this this um, king or this nation attacked Judah. And the, co the only comment it'll say is in those days, the Lord began to uh, or send uh, these kings against Judah. Second uh, Kings 1537 is an example. He sends Rezin of Aram Pekah against Judah. Now, no doubt if we a uh, modern historian wants to know more than that, like why did they attack? can't just be that God told them to. There's probably some political reasons, economic reasons, maybe vengeance reasons. I don't know. There's there's some kind of motivating reasons these kings decided to attack Judah. Mm -hmm. But the biblical historian is only interested in uh, the theological one at that point and just says, God's doing this because the people disobeyed and he's chastising them or something like that. He's trying to bring them back. Um, so th that definitely would not fit with a modern historical uh, method. <laughs> like to 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 say, um, God sent the United States against Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Like you're not going to find that in in the uh, in modern history, and I'm not suggesting that's the case. Just you know, <laughs> but sure. like uh, that's not what modern historians are, are interested in. So that distinguishes ancient historiography and the biblical historiography as well. So I believe the Bible writers were inspired by God, and that actually is the case that God was behind these historical events in, in sending maybe these kings. But there were other reasons as well, no doubt. Um, they weren't just suddenly brainwashed to go, I must attack Judah. There was probably some political and economic reasons in there of what was going on, but the biblical author is not interested in them. Sometimes it is, most times it's not. It's more interested in theological reasons rather than political reasons. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate that. Okay, so in your in your writings and I think some of your presentations, you've talked about how the idea of, of of strict history as a genre was not existing at the time period. Uh, could you talk about what you mean by that, as um, as well as why you would conclude that? Well, it's sort of like some of the things I was just referring to that distinguish modern history from mm -hmm. ancient history writing. Maybe not a strict chronological order is necessarily followed. They could be organized thematically. Mm -hmm. There could be the imposition of or the creation of speeches put into the mouths of characters um, as the historian thought appropriate. Mm -hmm. These are things that wouldn't be part of modern historical practice or modern historical method. Mm -hmm. um, focusing on the moral or theological reasons. So a lot of the things I was just talking about would actually distinguish the ancient version from modern yeah. history writing. Yeah. So there's no way it could be considered a mod good example of modern historical method when you're just describing a theological reason for mm -hmm. the invasion of a country. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess um, maybe like how you concluded that was, I guess we've looked at all of the texts that we have of that time period in that region and we don't see anything like what we see today in regards to history. But yeah, we do like, something similar to it, right? Yeah. So um, this is not my unique opinion. That's for sure. It's it's, it's <laughs> widely shared in historical studies. So uh, people do value, that, like for example, Herodotus and ancient Greek historians as as kind of the fathers of history in a lot of ways. But no one in a historical department will argue that they're actually doing history like we do today. I mean, uh, they do talk about how they do research. They talk about where they heard things from. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, you can see they're doing, um, 
they're doing the best they can. They're using, they're kind of inventing a genre at the time. Yeah. And, uh, but they're definitely not following uh, a modern historical process. And nobody just takes what they say at face value as, as if it was uh, modern history writing. So, uh, so I'm not saying to distinguish the two because I want to denigrate the Old Testament, hmm. but that we could have a, a proper perspective on what the genre is and, and what the expectation should be. And uh, we shouldn't try and impose onto the ancient text a modern framework for understanding it or mm -hmm. anachronistically suppose they're doing modern history writing when they're not. Yeah. Otherwise, you set yourself up for disappointment and set up the Bible for um, to be able to be uh, denigrated in that way. But the Bible is not that. That's not what the genre is. That's not what the purpose of the Bible is. So when you find that it's not modern history writing exactly, that's not a problem because that's not the genre it's written in. That's not where God chose, how God chose to communicate um, his revelation. Yeah. Yeah. So in, uh, in one of your books, you talked about how there are flashbacks in the narrative of first and second Samuel. Could you talk about that in regards to this whole historicity yeah. question? Um, like the, this is where uh, some, I think uh, in that book too, by Phil Long, he, he broaches this a little bit. Some people talk about how ancient history writing was more fictionalized than modern history writing. And in this way, it means it uses some of the kind of narrative elements you might think of um, in, in terms of his, uh, uh, fiction. So if you're reading a, a novel, you might have a flashback, right, to an earlier time. And uh, you, you get this in Samuel as well, where you have... Um, even in the uh, David and Goliath story. So David goes out, he kills Goliath. And then the next chapter, or at the end of the chapter, it says, when he was walking out to meet Goliath, uh, you have Saul say, turn to Abner and say, whose son is this guy? Who is this guy? And it's kind of a flashback because those events have already happened. But it's kind of for narrative or dramatic uh, sense, I guess. Because uh, as he was walking out to meet mm -hmm. Goliath, there's already this conversation that was going on, but we're told after the fact, right? Or later in the story when um, uh, David is living with the Philistines and he's marching out with them to go and attack Israel. And uh, then they turn, they, they send David back. They don't let him come with them to the war. This seems to be out of chronological order with uh, the chapter where uh, Saul goes to the uh, witch at Endor mm -hmm. or the medium. Um, this seems to take place before there's, there's those various things are a little bit out of chronological order, but not because they're mistaken, but because they've chosen to tell the story in that way. Kind of like a good novel, a flashback can be a lot more effective than just telling it all in chronological order. And so and that's that's the sense in which uh, this is written in sort of a fictional style. Um, but I don't like to use the word fictional because sure. we always think fictional means not true. But what it means, there's there's little flashbacks in here. Some things are out of chronological order. So for example, in the book of Kings, you have the story of, of Hezekiah and the deliverance of Jerusalem from the Assyrian invasion in chapters 18 and 19 of 2 Kings. And then in chapter 20, you have the story of when um, Hezekiah gets sick, a kind of famous story. And he prays for more, uh, that God would heal him. And God says, yes, you're going to give 15 years more. And he says, and I'll deliver this city from the Assyrians. Well, that was already narrated in chapter 18 and 19. So uh, chapter 20 actually chronologically would take place before chapter 18 and 19. But it's just it's just put in this different order for its own purposes. Mm -hmm. And so that that's that's one thing that might distinguish ancient historiography mm -hmm. from modern his, historicity or yeah. modern um, history writing. Uh, another interesting one you, you talked about was the whole speeches idea that they're not literally transcripts. Is there any in the book of first or second Daniel that like really stand out where you're like, yeah, that's probably not exactly what was said there. Is it, it's okay if not. Well, like uh, Samuel's speech in chapter 12, um, uh, many scholars have pointed to as being having the characteristics of speeches you see throughout the story from Joshua to second Kings. Hmm. So uh, this, the if one German scholar in the early 20th century, Martin note um, looked at these speeches and thought that he detected the hand of a single author. And he, he came up with this theory that all these books were put together 
in, by one author, drawing on other sources. Mm. And he called them the Deuteronomistic history because he saw Deuteronomy type language being used, especially in all these speeches like uh, Joshua, Samuel and Solomon and uh, or Second Kings 17, when, when it talk, chronicles the, the, the uh, downfall of the northern kingdom before Hezekiah. Uh, a lot of similar vocabulary is used throughout. And so it doesn't mean that what was said is uh, misleading or not historical in the sense that Samuel didn't say something like that, mm -hmm. but that the author was concerned to bring out his message in there. And we can see kind of the, the fingerprints of the author. Like, for example, if, if I was to tell you about a conversation I had with my wife last weekend, I would do my best to recall it and I would say it. I would speak in my own typical vocabulary that I use. But if we had a recording of that conversation, it would vary widely from what I'm saying. <laughs> but I hope I would give you the right gist of what we talked about, right. what was going on. And that's probably the maybe it's uh, all analogies break down. But that's, that's an example of something like that, where the historian is giving uh, a summary of a, a, a speech and, and probably using his own words and his own his own linguistic um, um, commonalities that he's always using, but he's giving you a fair representation of the gist of the speech or something like that. And also there's, there's the selectivity that's part of ancient historiography. They didn't tell us everything there was to know. Of course, modern history can't either. We can never tell everything there is to know about any historical event. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just too much detail that could be mentioned. So you're selective and you mention what is important for your purpose. And so for the book of Samuel, it's interested in um, Deuteronomy and how Israel uh, failed the covenant or kept the covenant throughout the, their history. And so it mentions events that are imp important to, mm -hmm. to see that. And so in speeches, it'll bring out Deuteronomic language to indicate whether the people are, are listening or to bring out the message of Deuteronomy, you know, to, to turn to God. Um, and these types of uh, things that we find in Deuteronomy are being brought forth by the, the author throughout. And the kings are all being evaluated on the basis of kind of Deuteronomic law. And so they're, they're selective in, in what they are, are mentioning, and they're mentioning things that they really want to get across to the audience. So it's selective, and it's, it's uh, focused on its own purpose and its own message. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in, in this specific example, uh, I think you said 1 Samuel 12, where there, there seems to be some similar language from Deuteronomy and maybe the same uh, writer, I guess. Uh, could you maybe talk about just hypothetical scenarios that scholars have um, theorized of how we can get from like these sources that you're talking about to the text we have today? Like, for example, if I have a source, I, my, I'm, I'm thinking, well, why not just write down the source? Um, are you saying that it was not like exactly like that because you said it was that they're using their own language? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, we don't know what their sources were, but uh -huh. I, I guess it's largely assumed the sources didn't include verbatim transcripts of, mm -hmm. of speeches. I see. As we see that their own characteristic vocabulary is used, um, even yeah. though it's you know, various characters um, speaking. Um, we don't know how much was recorded, um, what, the, what they were drawing on. I'm sure there was some verbatim uh, representation of the sources a good example can be seen between the books of chronicles and kings as an example of ancient historiography so the chronicler um, draws on samuel kings and he sometimes produces the passage close to verbatim or maybe he will for like five or six verses in a row before he adds something else when he adds that other thing sometimes it might be his own insight Sometimes it might be another source he's drawing on that he's putting in with it because the chronicler apparently had more sources than just the Book of Kings, but it clearly had the Book of Kings. So it's a mix of, of uh, verbatim quotation, maybe a mix of other sources, his own perspective, and also it seems to be paraphrased sometimes too. Um, so if you're going to write uh, a book and you want to write a good readable book, Mm -hmm. um, it may not always be best to just be co constantly copying the source verbatim, but you put it into uh, a more compelling narrative. And the books of Samuel are some of the most well-written and dramatic and uh, 
really creative compositions we have in, in the text. By creative, I don't mean fictitious. I mean really well written, really well drawn, complex characters presented. And like I said, there's flashbacks. Uh, there's uh, interesting ways of telling the story. And so I think that the author was a very sophisticated author. And if you want to write a story that's compelling, um, if it's just haphazardly here, you're quoting exact source, quoting exact source, and you just put them together, it won't be as good a read as if you, a good creative author, um, puts those together to make a compelling story mm -hmm. and not a compelling fictitious story, a, a true representation. So again, back to the art idea, um, it gives a good representation of what Samuel was like, what David was like. But the closer we get, we start to see maybe different artistic um, expressions, his own vocabulary, flashbacks, yeah. maybe not chronology all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and and definitely the the author was probably not compelled to only specifically draw on um, his source verbatim. Like the chronicler didn't either. The, the chronicler, even in those passages that are very similar to Kings, sometimes verbatim, but then every now and then it's paraphrased. You can see that he's drawing on Kings, but he's put it into his own words a little bit. And he's the chronicler is writing to a post-exilic audience where they've already come back from the exile and they're in the land and they have different questions than the audience of Kings, which was written in the exile. And so a lot of it has to do with the purpose of, of the book. What, what's the point they're trying to prove? What's the message that God has for that audience? And they draw on sources and they write the text in light of the purpose that they're trying to emphasize the theological message God had for their audience. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So you, you talked about the, when it was written, how, how do we know that this is when the books of first and second Samuel were written? Well, we, we don't know for sure. Um, I, I think the strongest argument for the final composition into the history of Joshua to second Kings comes from the end of second Kings. The last event referenced in the end of second Kings is the elevation of this King Jehoiakim, who had been taken into exile, one of the last Judah kings. And he's elevated to be, he's freed from prison and able to eat at the table of the Babylonian king and given a portion daily. And that's how it ends. It's kind of a uh, anticlimactic ending, you could say. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that event takes place during the Babylonian exile, mm -hmm. not when it's done. So probably, um, the book was written in the exile, and that was kind of the last historical event mm. that they thought at least relevant to communicate. Uh, so it, uh, in my mind, I do not think it was written after the exile came to an end and they returned to the land, or they probably would mention that or at least point to the fact they're going back. Instead, the, the, the only hope they had, they're holding on to Davidic promises that there will be a son of David on the throne, mm. going back to 2 Samuel 7. But the end of Kings has Jehoiakim, being lifted, um, elevated from prison. It says he's seated actually on a kisse, which is this word for seat or throne. So interestingly, the last son of David in the story is given a, a throne, and it's above all the other kings in Babylon, it says. And I, this seems to me reminiscent of 2 Samuel 7, where um, uh, and, and the Davidic promises about the prominence of the Davidic king. And so I think it's a hopeful notice at the end, mm -hmm. although it's not, it hasn't come to fulfillment. We don't see those Davidic promises come to fulfillment, but there's a hint there that we're still hoping that God is going to fulfill those promises. So there's a, it ends on a note of hope, but um, not on a note of return. So I think that the books of Joshua to Kings, which seem to all run together as one coherent story, um, were finished in the exile. Mm -hmm. Now, the books of Samuel themselves talk about events that happened well before the exile. You know, David is like 500 years before the exile. <laughs> And so no doubt there were portions or perhaps perhaps whole books written beforehand that were put together into this long history writing by the writer in the exile, who scholars call the Deuteronomist, not because that's his name, but that's just the title they give him because he writes this whole story in light of Deuteronomy. And so that person probably drew on what there was of the text of Samuel or sources that became Samuel and put them together into a long coherent story of Israel's history to teach them why they're in exile, um, show them how they broke the covenant, they turned away from God, 
but also to give them hope, you know, emphasizing there's aspects of the story of David that are hopeful, like those promises to David um, for a future um, king of David. And so there's hope mixed with the reason for their punishment that comes all the way through. And you see it even with the request for a king in Samuel. Samuel warns them that um, this was a sin. God says they've actually rejected me, not you. But there, there's been this history that Israel keeps turning away. And Samuel warns them that these kings are going to be problems for you. And sure enough, eventually the kings turn bad and they do lead the people astray at the end in exile. Mm -hmm. So he puts this all together. But as far as the earliest texts uh, that were drawn on to create Samuel, scholars have all sorts of theories, but no textual evidence. So some people talk about the ark narrative. So you get the story in Samuel where the ark is uh, taken by the Philistines into Philistine territory for a while, you know, and their, their idols fall down to it. They eventually return it. And then the ark is finally brought to Jerusalem by David in 2 Samuel. Some people think that was originally a story about the ark. Um, and then it was incorporated or it was used to put together to create this history. And so it's possible. It, has it been proven? No. Mm -hmm. But it, it's possible that was a source. So people try, a lot of scholars get fascinated with the potential um, delineation of these sources. So the Ark narrative could be one. Some people point out how Samuel is such a prominent character at the beginning. And then when the Ark story kicks in, Samuel's not even around for some of it. Uh, that's probably because it was originally a source about mm -hmm. the Ark. That's possible. There's also the theory that the, there's the, one of the big sources in Samuel is the history of David's rise. And so it starts with maybe the anointing of David going on until he's in 2 Samuel. He's king over all Israel, uh, reigning with justice and equity forever. All It's just a very positive source about David. And then some people think the succession narrative starts after that, where it chronicles the down spiral of the Davidic house and, and moves towards the succession of Sa Solomon to the throne. And that source is often thought to be very critical of David. You know, it emphasizes all the potential ways in which David failed or failed to do the right thing um, or uh, and all sorts of things like that. So some people say these three sources and there's more um, were put together to create the book of Samuel. And it's possible. Obviously, the biblical authors draw on sources, especially when you get to the book of Kings. They reference sources quite a bit. And when you get to the chronicler, he, he references sources even more. So there's no, just like Luke in the New Testament in the gospel says he does a bunch of research to write his gospel. So similarly, the authors in the Old Testament did research to come up with their historical narrative. Now, those sources are speculative. We don't have, what I mean by we don't have textual evidence, we don't have a copy of the book of the history of David's rise on its own. Like we haven't found a book like, oh, this just starts here and tells the story of David. We don't have any textual evidence. So it's they're speculative in the way that they're a creation of a scholarly um, imagination, but they come off clues they think they see in the text as to what, what might have been um, a source that was behind it. I'm a little skeptical on this, on uh, the ability of modern scholars to delineate sources without textual evidence. Yeah. I don't have a theological problem with their existence, and I do think <laughs> that the authors drew on sources. But as far as whether we can confidently say we this is a source, I think a lot of the arguments break down on close scrutiny. For example, even in the history of David's rise, which I think is very positive of David the whole way through, I think all the way through David is a very complex character. Even when he's going to go fight Goliath, he's he shows a lot of ambition. He's like, oh, what's, the, what's the reward for this? If I go kill Goliath? And he asks like three times. There's like so he's already a kind of a bit of a complex character. Even in that story, he he almost goes and, and kills um, the fool, Nabal, and all his household because he's offended. And then Abigail kind of keeps him from that. But he's he's hot headed. He, he makes some mistakes. Um, I think he's a complex character throughout. And, and so I don't think you can just split it off into a positive um, source and a negative mm -hmm. source. And I, I, I think that it's, it's much more integrated than that. Although I do think that sources were used especially by the person who put it together in exile, like 500 years later. He just didn't make up these stories of David. The, the existence and historicity of David have been um, backed up by archaeological findings that reference the House of David as being an historical dynasty in Judah, although it can't uh, tell us everything that the Bible says about David is true. But David was an historical person, and, and there was a dynasty named after him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the as far as the archaeological evidence, we, we, we don't have a ton correct 
uh, what would you say we do have about David and and this, you know, Solomon, King Saul, Samuel? I mean, do we have any yeah. evidence for all that? Well, the historical record is very uh, partial, right? And and uh, what we find a uh, hundred years from now, we might find a lot more. You never know. But right now, uh, we only have references to David in epigraphic evidence that is on something, an engraving, uh, an inscription that's mm -hmm. been dug out of the dirt. We have the House of David um, mentioned in reference to the dynasty uh, that David started. And so this is found on the famous Tel Dan stele and also on the ancient uh, the Meshe stele or the Moabite stone. Both likely are referencing the um, House of David. And so that gives support for the historicity. There was a dynasty named after David. Before those things were discovered, um, some people were starting to say it was just all fictional. Like Philip Davies, famous skeptical scholar from Sheffield, was thinking, oh, David's just about as historical as King Arthur, he famously said. <laughs> and then they discovered this and like, oh, looks like he is historical. Um, and so I think uh, those are, he's the only king that, of Solomon, David, and Samuel that we have uh, epigraphic evidence, something mm -hmm. written, inscribed in stone or clay that we found. Um, Solomon is not mentioned, but there's a lot of archaeological evidence for the existence of a monarchy, um, especially as it expanded under Solomon. Solomon's uh, kingdom expanded on David's, and you have uh, archaeological evidence for um, monumental architecture at the time. That is big buildings that were, would have to take a uh, centralization of a government to get built, not just mm. this kind of wayward, um, random little towns that kind of had an association. You had to have a monarchy. There had to be taxes. There had to be a, a, a workforce that was organized. So they call that monumental architecture. And there's lots of evidence for the monumental architecture at the time of Solomon, different um, gates that have been found. Uh, there's there's the possibility David's palace could be represented in some um, some ar excavations in Jerusalem, um, but the excavations we, we've only really excavated small portions of a lot of things. But and there's debate when you find an archaeological remains, um, it's hard to date unless there's a, a coin or an inscription, and those are rare. And so uh, trying to figure out exactly what represent what era is difficult. But I do think there's strong evidence for the existence of a monarchy um, and uh, and even just in uh, archaeological evidence about the, the, the decline and of, of Philistines in certain territories are associated with like David's success against the Philistines. They look at pottery use and these types of things, but it's limited. Um, if we didn't have the text of the Bible, there's very little we could say <laughs> about all of this. But in, yeah. in, but the archaeology supports there being um, the nation of Israel at the time and the expansion and uh, the building of monumental architecture, which supports, I think, is consistent with what we see in David and Solomon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting because we don't have a lot to go on, but at the same time, it's not like it's just like some super biased portrayal of these characters. Like mm -hmm. it, um, so that that does lend a little of authenticity um but also when we do see the like the tail dance stealing you it's it's not just like a, a reference to a guy named david like house of david that that sounds pretty prestigious correct yeah it's definitely um the tail dance still comes like over 100 years after david but it's it's referencing the dynasty in judah calling it the house of david right which is typical nomenclature in the ancient world the house of uh, Omri or something would be the Omri dynasty in the north. And so it's definitely referring to there was a dynasty of kings in Judah named after David. And so there's clear evidence of that. And so in that way, it's prestigious in that David really did. He was a king who uh, unified Israel and started a dynasty that lasted for a long time. As, as you move on into the book of Kings, there's more and more references in extra biblical material to these kings. A lot of the kings are mentioned in Assyrian sources. Um, and that's just as Assyria, this, this great big empire at the time, encroached upon Israelite territory. Mm -hmm. More and more they would reference kings of the area, right? And so then we get like kings like Ahaz, uh, Hezekiah, Manasseh, all these kings being mentioned in Assyrian texts. 
Uh, they don't chronicle the story of them. Oh, well, every now and then there's a little bit of overlap where we hear a little bit of their story, but most of the time it's just a reference to whether they paid them tribute or something like this. But but they're mentioned, and so it verifies that the Bible is talking about actual historical figures more and more as as time progresses. And uh, we don't have a Solomon one yet. I wouldn't be surprised if someday we find one, but we don't have one at the time. Um, but sometimes you excavate for years and you never find an archive or like a library. They've been excavating at Hatzor, which was the biggest city of the Canaanites and was a very prominent city in the, in the land of ancient Palestine or Canaan. And they've been excavating for decades and decades, still haven't found an archive in there. But they likely would have one because it was one of the biggest cities in the area. If they ever find that archive, well, well then we'll look and see if, um, what's, what's referenced in it. But it's, it's, it's very slow, meticulous work. Hmm. It's often only a small portion of uh, a tell that gets excavated. It just takes a lot of time. It depends on volunteer yeah. work, it's short excavation season. So it's limited. So it, it's significant, though, that we have reference to so many Israelite kings in the epigraphic evidence, which I think supports that the Bible is talking about real people. Hmm. Yeah. So you, you talked about, you know, we do have, you know, from an archaeological perspective, we, we don't have a full picture from this um from the text that we do have first and second samuel and these other texts you say that you know it's historiography so it's not completely literal um do, does any of that uh maybe cause doubt in your eyes as far as the the trustworthiness or inspiration i mean when you think about like if if the first and second samuel if they're writing and they're saying, hey, this happened, but it didn't literally happen that way. Why, why would you not consider that an error? Um, well, I think um, I'm not suggesting it didn't literally happen or something like that. But that, well, well we could say that, um, go back to my example in 2 Kings 18, 19, and 20, where 20 takes place before 18. Mm -hmm. If you mean literally is in the order it's written in the scriptures, it didn't literally happen that way, then I'd say uh, that's true. Um, but it's not actually trying to say that. It, it it recounts an event that happened before, it recounts it after purposefully for its own thematic reasons. And so I'm not suggesting that's a problem for the dependability or the uh, the view a view of scripture. Yep. Um, so I think it really comes down to understanding what scripture was trying to do. And, and genre is really important there. It's like Psalms is not literally true. God is not a rock. But that's silly to argue that that undermines the Bible's reliability because clearly it doesn't mean he's literally a rock, right? And so similarly, when something is written in an ancient historical genre, anything that is... Uh, appropriate in that genre is completely appropriate for the Bible as well, because that's the, that's the genre that God was using to reveal himself. Mm -hmm. And so it only becomes a problem if you say, no, I think the Bible was written in modern history, uh, the genre of modern history writing, and then it becomes a problem. But that's imposing a modern genre on an ancient one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we can't make demands of the Bible that the, the Bible was written in the way we would like to write it today um, based on our concerns and our, our genres. The Bible is written in the ancient world to an ancient people who had different expectations of a story. And so I think it doesn't undermine the Bible's um, uh, value, reliability, inspiration at all that, that it's written in an ancient genre. In fact, the Bible would, would say that um, it, God, um, God revealed himself in, in different times, in different ways. Uh, prophecy is a different genre. Poetry is a different genre. Ancient historiography is its own genre. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry, I, I was a little confusing with the, the question. So I, I basically asked you two questions earlier. But so you answered the first one. Uh, the second one, um, does the lack of archaeological evidence cause any doubt in your eyes as far as the historicity? No, I think we have as much archaeological evidence as we would necessarily expect given the mm -hmm the limited amount available and the li limited amount of art um, excavations allowed. It's a, it's a, it can be a contentious issue to excavate 
for example, in Jerusalem, and uh, it, it's hard. You can't exactly dig up the Temple Mount. You know, it's a holy place, <laughs> and uh, it just yeah. can't be done. So there's all sorts of things that we're not going to be able to find um, because we can't dig there, right? And then, of course, politically, there's uh, several nations there and uh, sensitivities on digging and where you can dig. And then even when you get to dig, it is a limitation on how long it takes and what you can do. I think because the evidence we have fits well with the, the presentation of the story in the text, I, I, I have no doubts that the archaeology is not a problem for me. Mm -hmm. I think it supports the narrative. And we can't expect that if something's true, we, we will always find some kind of archaeological support for it. It'll never be able to prove David lusted after Bathsheba no matter how much we can excavate. You know what I mean? Like you have to trust the text representation, but the archaeology we have would suggest mm -hmm. there was a nation at the time and uh, that they, they did have uh, some expansion of territory from what we can determine mm -hmm. with pottery and, and um, interactions with Philistines. Monumental architecture suggests Solomonic um, uh, kingdom grew and, and was more wealthy. Um, so I think we have everything we can expect to find. Mm -hmm. um, and we might find more one day. But archaeology is also takes a lot of um, interpretation to figure out what's being said about it, right? So there are people who don't think the Old Testament is historically true. So sometimes uh, referred to as the minimalist, sometimes as a badge of honor, other times as a critique. Some people call them minimalist. But uh, for example, Israel Finkelstein, who's not really a minimalist per se, but he He's come up with what's called the low chronology, and his his theory is basically um, he's dated all the evidence that is previously thought to to Solomon's time. He dates it about a hundred years later, and so uh, this is called the low chronology. And uh, I don't think the evidence is compelling, and it, it he likes to completely ignore um, anything from the Bible, and scientifically as his way of saying let's not let the Bible tamper with the evidence we're finding out of the ground or something like that's his method but he's basically our makes the davidic empire and the solomonic empires disappear and so some people think that there was no united monarchy based on kind of a low chronology view or something mm -hmm. like that i'm simplifying it quite a bit it's quite yeah. uh, quite complex but i really don't think that they've won the day the low chronology and that there's there's a stronger argument to be made the traditional dating uh, that archaeologists uh, put this in the time frame of, of Solomon. Um, but he, he wants to argue that it, there was no united monarchy and so associates a lot of it later with the uh, Omri dynasty, which comes to prominence in the north after the division of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But I'm not convinced by those arguments, but there's, there's lots more we could uh, delve into about that. I do think the archaeology uh, supports the representation of history as we see in, in the Bible. Okay, awesome. I appreciate that. So uh, a lot of the time when I've been talking to maybe what they call more liberal scholars, just you may, maybe not Christian, or they're, they're looking at it from a purely secular perspective. They don't have this idea of inspiration or anything like that. They, they look at a lot of the texts from outside the Bible, and they see that a lot of these texts that maybe might seem historical, they're, they're not terribly historical like you, you have this idea of like uh, of a king um kind of like you know a propaganda narrative where they're they're just trying it's not a historical text they're just trying to make the king look really really good um you see that in a lot of like um egypt and babylon stuff like that um, yep. so i'm not saying that this is specifically in first first and second samuel although maybe i'm sure some have argued that uh, but um a lot of people would say, hey, like we've got all these texts from outside the Bible. We don't have a literal history as like we have today. And a lot of and most of the time we don't even have history in general. Like if it's just, just you know, little beats and pieces of it. Uh, but a lot of it is uh, maybe not maybe not allegorized. But, you know, there's there's other points of the of the writing. So, you know, you talked about Herodotus being, uh, you know, historiography, but why why don't you take that specific position on first and second samuel compared to uh, a greek writer that's writing you know many years later do you, do you understand what i'm asking there 
Why don't I take what position on Samuel? Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the like the, the the more liberal scholarship position where, like, maybe the writer of First and Second Samuel was not trying to make a, any historical claims. Uh, they were mainly focused on other things. It's it's maybe it's not even the idea of historiography in general. Why do you take the a position later of someone like Herodotus compared to one of these other like non-historical positions on the genre of the text? So, um, yeah, some people think that it's fictional um, in it's just some of the minimalists, like I referenced, talk about these stories as being written to create um, a history for a small impoverished people in the post-exilic period. So uh, in the in the Persian period of Yehud, uh, they, they've argued that the whole history of Israel was invented at that time to give those people a history. Um, I think that's a weak argument because if you were going to create this great history to look back to, why would you paint it in such negative terms? Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, patriarchs, they sometimes point to the patriarchs, say they're not historical. They're just invented to give them an ancient history. Well, the patriarchs flout later customs that, you know, they um, they set up pillars which are actually condemned in, in the Deuteronomic law. You're not supposed to set up a pillar for religious purposes. Uh, you know, they marry sisters like Leah and Rachel. They do all sorts of things that go against Mosaic law. I think that undermines the idea they were invented at the time. If you're going to make up a grand history of of, of your kings, um, why would you have most of them be so bad? Mm -hmm. And uh, if David is going to be your hero king, why would you show his dark side so much? I, I think that it undermines the idea that they're just invented to give this heroic history for a people. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't follow those arguments. Part of the argument was also to do with whether there was writing in the ancient world. They always argue that there was no writing, so then hmm. it had to be written that much later. But we have all sorts of examples of of writing in the ancient world. Even soldiers guarding a, a fort, they'll, they'll, they'll write out the alphabet. Um, all, I, they call it ABC theory. Um, that they find it almost seems like it's a graffiti by a bored soldier or something like this. But we have lots of example that there was writing. Um, so I, I don't think that the argument that this is all uh, a fiction makes sense. You could uh, point to its purposes. It depends. At what point does uh, the fact that an author has a purpose, mm -hmm. um, at what point does it undermine its historicity? So the point to the David story is to emphasize um, that David maybe, especially early on, is better than Saul. David is um, the one God chose um, to succeed Saul and to unite the tribes uh, uh, and to deliver them from the Philistines. So there's a lot of positive spin on David's actions early on. So in that, um, some people have looked at the story of David as an apology. An apology is not saying I'm sorry, but a way to defend someone from charges, like apologetic literature would defend David from charges the David dynasty was under. So some people have said, the, if you look at the story of David, probably it's to defend uh, the Davidic dynasty from charges that they stole the dynasty from Saul. So that's why they mentioned that David did not do anything against Saul. His hand didn't come against him. He didn't kill Abner, Saul's general. He had nothing to do with it. He was innocent in all of his dealings with his predecessor. And, and he, he rose to prominence because he was helping Israel, you know, like he was fighting the Philistines successfully. The people loved him. Um, so in, in this sense, you could see how it has apologetic elements to show why David was a good successor. Yeah. But the fact that the author is showing the positive sides of David doesn't mean it's not true. It's like, can we never write a story in history about, say, Winston Churchill, some of the good things he did to rally the people in the war and good decisions he made? Well, I think that it's just all a lie because you're talking about the good things he did, right? So that method doesn't really work. But Stephen McKenzie writes a biography of David where he takes this as his, his methodological approach. He says, I'm going to look at who benefits. And if someone benefits, they're behind it. So, you know, Saul dies and that makes clears the way for David to be king. That means David had something to do with it. Or Abner dies. Well, that allows uh, uh, David to just put Joab in charge of the army and get rid of Abner. Well, that means David was behind it. And it's actually a very bad methodological approach. 
Um, it, you could apply that to all sorts of things in real life. And if anyone benefits from anything, it means they're guilty. It, it's, it's not a rational, logical approach, but this is the way some people have, have looked at the David story, that it's defending David from charges, um, that he was a usurper, that he, 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 he sought the, uh, the monarchy for himself. He killed his predecessor. He killed off the descendants, even though it says the Philistines did. Or maybe he was a, a traitor. He joined the Philistines. He joined the enemy and, and used that to take over. Well, the Bible does talk about how he went to the Philistines. But while he was there, he was actually fighting against Judah's enemies. Um, so um, uh, MacArthur writes an article on this, I think, in JBL. And if you look at his Anchor Bible commentary, he has a big section on, on this as apologetic literature. And he points out an example in the ancient world of this Hittite king, Hattusili III, who similarly, there's an apology of Hattusili, who defends him from charges. He was a usurper, and it has a lot, a lot of analogous kind of things are mentioned. But uh, And I don't deny that I think uh, 1 Samuel... Uh, a lot of it is showing David to be a better successor or a, a positive successor who wins Israel and, and delivers uh, them from the Philistines and God uses in a lot of ways. But I don't think it's just strictly apologetic literature because, like I said, I think he's a complex character throughout showing his uh, flaws and hints of his failure even early on. And eventually, of course, chronicles his failure. Uh, um, some people might want to parse that out by saying the negative pieces are a second source. I, I don't think you can do it that easily. So I don't think that just the, the reason that there's some positivity to David yeah. um, means that it's fictional. And that's not just the case. I think he's talking about real people. And uh, based on the archaeological evidence we do have, David did exist. And uh, the presentation of David as not being this hero who is without flaws doesn't make me suspicious that the whole thing is, is fictional. But anybody can say what they want. You can have an opinion on that. We can't prove, like I said, even if suddenly we're able to excavate Jerusalem as much as we want and we find out there's a palace of David, we find out all these things, mm -hmm. it'll still never prove the details of the story. Like I said, his affair with Bathsheba. It's possible most people never found out about that for quite some time. He did a pretty good cover-up of that. Bathsheba herself might not have known that he killed Uriah off the way he did, right? We don't know. So archaeology is never going to substantiate all the details of these yep. texts. Um, so I just going on uh, the presentation of the story seems realistic. Mm -hmm. it, it, it coheres yep. with what we know of archaeology. And, I, and it seems to me that the story from Joshua to Kings is concerned with historical personages and history. And so it depends on our disposition toward the text. Yeah. Um, so that's that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you you talked about, you know, you know, not assume, but, you know, there, there, that you think there's good reason to think that the entire thing is trustworthy, that you've talked about a position where it, you know, it kind of assumes that we just can't just assume that it's it's trustworthy that there might be reasons to think that there's not you said that those don't they're not good evidence for that um and maybe you've briefly talked about this but maybe like what about like a middle position where you have just what the the writer like w what was true and maybe he wanted to throw in details just to make the story sound better or uh, may emphasize the the point of what he was trying to describe about you know different things like maybe just like the apologetic for david so you know maybe like you know if you counted all of the instances where there was a a positive note about david and um say there's hypothetically 10 mentions of it what what like would you have any issue with the writer uh, first and second Samuel, just throwing in an additional one, an 11th one, if it makes the story cohere better or sound better, um, even if it's not literally or even if it might even be considered a fictional point. Do you have an issue with that? I think, um, like you said, it's a hypothetical that we'll never know. Mm -hmm. But I think based on the character of the story, and the, the broader story that I think the author was concerned with history and not with just um, fiction, adding in fictionalized stories to make a point. Um, he told things um, maybe with a spin or a slant and was selective and didn't tell other stories 
or emphasize certain stories in a way that would emphasize this point. Mm -hmm. But I don't see it likely that the author is just going to add in things completely devoid of, of, of uh, what he thought was true or, or what happened. Um, Lava, going back to the speeches, the speeches, I think, are composed by the author, but they put into the speech, in, into the speech of the king or whoever it is, what they think most likely happened on that occasion. Not, I'm going to throw a speech in there that would never have actually been said, but hey, it'll, it'll be a good read. I'll throw that in there. I don't think that's the approach because, so since I characterized the author as concerned with historical personages and doing a fair representation of the character and the events, I, I don't think that they would have just added in random things unless they thought it was likely something like that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't prove all those details. We can't verify everything. But based on my reading of it, that's, that's, that's my approach. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. Well, that concludes pretty much all my questions there. Uh, there was a question, a couple questions that uh, people watching the channel wanted to ask you. Do you have a second to answer those? Sure. All right, cool. All right. So this is on the screen. I don't know if you can see it. Um, so basically, uh, Old Testament scholar Dr. Juha Pakala argues that there are hints of Yahweh being a sun god in 1 Kings 8, 12 to 13. What does Dr. Evan thinks of these claims? Oh, well, one of my supervisors uh, went to the University of Toronto and Wycliffe College, uh, Glenn Taylor, writes a whole book on this topic. It's called Yahweh and the Sun. So I'd recommend his book to you if you want to check it out. But he points to a lot of solar imagery being used of, of God in ancient um, seals that are found. Um, and, uh, and he thinks, his argument is that early on, um, Yahweh was associated with the sun as a representation of the high God or all that is good. Um, and uh, for example, if you look back to Jacob wrestling with uh, God in Genesis 32, mm -hmm. um, he wrestles with this man at night. And then um, at the end, it says, as the sun goes overhead, you know, he, he says he names it Peniel, um, uh, which is uh, face of God. He saw God and he survived. And he thinks that's solar imagery too. And he looks at Egyptian myths of the sun, where at night the sun is in one form. And then um, uh, when dawn breaks, it comes up as the sun. And he sees that as a similarity there that God might be pictures. Of. That's why he says to Jacob, let me go where it's almost, it's almost daybreak. And then it comes up as the sun. And I mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. It's intriguing. Um, it is possible that the sun could have been seen as some kind of, uh, I mean, what's more glorious than the sky than the sun, that perhaps there's some kind of representational um, of, of God there. I'm not actually convinced by it as much as I love my supervisor, Glenn Taylor. I think he brings out a lot of good evidence and how they use solar imagery in connection with ancient um, Israelite um, inscriptions and, and seals. But I don't think that... Uh, Yahweh was viewed as a sun god. Um, and in, in even going back to Genesis 1, when God creates the um, the greater and the lesser lights on day four, I, I note that it, he doesn't mention the sun, he just calls it the greater light. That's because the sun, Shemesh, in Hebrew, it, that's actually the name of the god in ancient or eastern um, uh, Canaanite uh, pantheons. Um, Genesis 1 is anti-polytheistic uh, and it doesn't even want to mention the sun because it's, it's such a popular God. I don't think that um, Yahweh is a sun God, um, even if maybe there is some, some intriguing uh, connections at times. But God is mm -hmm. the one who creates everything. So I see, I see a distinction there. Hmm. Well, much appreciated for that. All right. Uh, one more question from here. So, uh, did the Neo Assyrians use the Enuma Elish conquering discovered nations into an ordered empire as a justification in their conquest? I recall C.L. Crouch wrote a paper on this. Do you have any idea about this question? Sorry, I, I don't. I'd have to. I'd have to look into that more. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's all we have here. Um, any other questions um, or any other thoughts you want to add? Uh, any places you want people to go to check out your work? Well, um, 
Well, my commentary in First and Second Samuel for questions on commentary. Uh, I mean, on, on Samuel, I would check it out. I have an academia.edu page where I post all the articles I'm allowed to post. Like after it gets published, usually after a year or two, you can publish it. Okay. Um, so I've got a bunch of articles in there if you're interested. A lot to do with um, Kings, um, some on Chronicles. I, I have a, a fairly recent one on... Um, characterization of Saul and Samuel, which is one of my favorite yep. little essays I've written. So that's an easy access. I have a, my latest book is called Sennacherib and the War of 1812, where I compare uh, the invasion of Sennacherib when Hezekiah is king and how both Sennacherib and the Bible claim that they won that war. And I compare it with the War of 1812, where Americans and the British or the Canadians both claim that they won that war. So I use that as an analogy to, to argue um, that both sides have an argument to be made there, but that people shouldn't <laughs> criticize the Bible as being untrue because it claims that they won the war. I could talk about that for another two hours, but anyway, we won't go into that. But that's that's one of my more latest books, if you if you want to check that out. But yeah, that that's pretty much where you'd find a lot of my work on my academia.edu page. Mm. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on here, Dr. Evans. We'll definitely have to have you on about your your other works you're talking about here. But right. uh, other people can check the stuff out in the description. I've already got the links there. And otherwise, I do hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. You too. Great chatting awesome. with you. Yeah. Thanks so much. God bless.